This is JPEG The Raw, show number 37, uh, recorded on April 17th, and I'm again joined by Tim Kimperley, and we, uh, this is take two, by the way, because <laughs> we, we streamed to the right, we, me, I streamed to the wrong site at first. Uh, we're on Justin TV now, and I started the stream on a live stream. Uh, but we have Tim Kimperley back, and we're again missing Kathleen, who is in the process of uh, moving into a new house, and somebody, was that you, Scott, that said, She's actually going on a cruise right now. I think that's what she told me, yeah. Yeah. She's, she's, for most of this month, she's working on moving into a house and in the middle of that, you know, taking a vacation. So she'll be back in May. Next week, we don't have a show. I'm, I'm traveling. Um, so next week, we won't have a show, and then we're back in May. And that was the voice of Scott Green. He is back tonight. Scott, is this your second or third time with us? Third time. Third time. So tonight, we're, instead of calling him a guest, we're going to call him co-host. <laughs> that's how you roped me in watch out Scott yeah that's how I got Kathleen in here too <laughs> I just invite guests that they want to talk to um, and speaking of Scott you know he is, his show I, I don't remember exactly what number it is but we were talking about this in the pre-show you know continues to get downloaded as people watch that it's a, it's a great show where Scott's talking to us about using speed lights for lighting and, and the, you know what he does and he has some great images um, we'll put the sh we'll put it in the in the show notes what show he is was on. You can go back and watch that one, and of course this one. And you know if you're wa listening to this afterwards, we uh, we do still have more people who listen to the audio podcast rather than the video. We if you're listening to it and wondering this would be so much better if I could see it, we do have two you know videos. Ever since show number four, we have uh, video large and video small, so you can download either one of those. They're both available on our website on iTunes, whatever other podcatcher you have. Um, so, Tim, uh, Scott, we have a little bit of news. And we'll start with the first one that Scott can, can help defend. Because both of these, two of the news, two of the news stories are going to be anti-Kathleen. So she's not here to defend herself. But the first one um, is, you know, often, let's see if I can pull this up. Yeah, I have to go this way. Often, you know, people switch to Mac because they say it's, you know, unlike Windows, it's not prone to virus. And that's just, that's just simply not the case. It is, what, what it is, is that because the vast majority of the PCs, something like 95% are uh, computers for PCs instead of Macs, most people who write viruses write it for the PC. The downside of that, the, the two situations have happened. One is the PC user is battle scarred and has... We, most of us, there's still a lot of us who don't know, but most of us know you don't click on that Ni Norwegian, you know, or Nigerian, Nigerian prince who wants to give you a million dollars. Or if you see a pop-up that says, you know, Windows antivirus has discovered a virus, you don't click on that because that is the virus. Uh, and then when you click on it, it installs it. And a lot of, most of us, you know, maybe you too, Tim, we, uh, we run antivirus on our PCs. Absolutely. But the, I, I, re I read somewhere that something like 90 plus percent of Mac users do not use any antivirus at all. Nope, that Scott, is true. Scott, do you use one? I do not. We have, I'm on Macs at my day job as well. And the corporate office, there's just a handful of us that use Macs. So they have a system-wide uh, antivirus and they have a Mac version. But up until this year, seven years, I've never had virus software on my Mac, and I've never had it on these here at the house either. Yeah. Well, it's all about keeping your software updated, and, and this looks like uh, was a Java update that needed to be installed, and, and a lot of people don't update, and that goes for Windows users as well, and that's where the, uh, the bad guys actually come in and, and do something to your computer then. Yeah, and I think that this was some kind of bot or something like that. That was me. That, some kind of bot net or something like that where he got, you know, Trojan Horse where he got people on there. But it, <clears throat> it affected over 600,000 Macs. And, again, since the majority of them don't have antivirus, a lot of them don't even know it's, it happened. And, and, you know, Macs, I think, you know, even though I, I said that the majority of PCs, computers are PCs, I think it's something like a 95 to 5 percent, something like that. I would bet you, if you looked, if you dug into the numbers, you'd find that the home use, that number has gone up some for Mac. I think overall, 
the sheer number of Macs is higher, but the percent of the market share is not changed that much. But I bet if you look at home users, that number has shifted a little bit more. Oh, I think so. I know more people now that own a Mac than probably uh, three years ago, two or three years ago. I probably know 10 times the amount that I used to know. Yeah. Not that I will ever switch over, but uh, and I do like my iPad, but I, I can't go to a Mac. And I'm, I've had the best of both worlds, I guess, for, I don't know, ever since I, the last six years. I used to be PC. I worked on Macs at, at my day job, had PCs here at the house. And for the longest time, I defended PC. I was like, you know, there's really no difference. And there's not, as long as you can beef up the PC that you're using for the amount of, you know, whatever your workflow is. Mm -hmm. But it, it came to the point where I just got tired of, you know, the, the Windows uh, operating systems would update and then it would just get, to me, it was all quirky on my end. So I just went with Mac because that's what I was used to at work. And, yeah. you know, I was working on a seven-year-old computer there and it was still as strong as what I had here. So I made the conversion and now I'm 100% Mac everywhere, so... Yeah, and I think I think you know more, Mac is getting more and more people to buy their computers, and and that comes with um, you know now you get the attention of the virus people and they start coming after you. So you know maybe some since PCs have already kind of um, blazed that trail of learning experience and, and reacting to those viruses because the uh, Microsoft is pretty quick that when a uh, you know security hole comes out they patch it pretty fast and you, and there's a lot of choice on antivirus there too. I think that, that trail's been blazed, so Apple will probably respond fairly quickly to these things. It's just an unfortunate um, See, I wonder if situation. they will, though. I mean, it seems like Apple is very reluctant to point out any of these issues. Well, and they and were it's almost like they're trying to bury it under a carpet as opposed to reacting to it. I think they were somewhat slow in responding to this one, too, because apparently they knew for a while. But I, I think it, you know, it, it won't take them as long to get up to speed as it did Microsoft, because that was still new back then. And I think, you know, this danger will come around. And only, you know, this isn't a PC show or a Mac show, but it, you know, ultimately us as photographers, the majority of the people listening to this, if not everybody, uses a Mac or a PC to edit your photos. So it does affect us in some way. Um, and, you know, and, and that's something you need to be aware of. Uh, on a PC, you definitely should be running of antivirus. On your Mac, yeah, I don't know. You, you you have to maybe Scott can tell us, but you do need to take simple precautions. Don't click on those, nor um, nor what is it, Nigerian? Yeah, Nigerian well, print. don't don't click on a link from somebody you don't know. Yeah, I mean, I I, I know some people that send out messages and and I never click in on it, even if I know they're sending it, because they're not techno technology, they're not able to tell whether or not they have a virus in the first place. So I don't trust what they're sending to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I will say something, Mike. For anybody that is interested or curious about the jump from PC to Mac, uh, when I got my design job six years ago, I had never touched a Mac in my life. And day one of my job, I'm thrown into a, a Macintosh G5 computer, and it's basically, I mean, it's such an easy transition. I mean, instead of a control button, you have a command button. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. the same thing. I use a Dell mouse with my Mac. Um, it's such an easy transition between yeah. the two. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, and it has been for a while, a very viable uh, choice. I mean, really, it's, you, you, you're either going to get a Mac or a PC. You know, Linux is, is just never made the inroads into the desktop or anything like that. And I don't want to, I don't want to get into that too much, but but anyway, just if you use a Mac, you know, take some precaution. Uh, second thing is Canon has announced, uh, let me pull this up, that there is a light leak in the, the sensor on the 5D Mark III. There is a, apparently from either, I think it's from the top, that LED thing at the top, that some of that light is leaking into the sensor and affecting the, and it has to be an extremely dark situation. So I guess you're outside at night and you're taking photos at night. Um, and that light from the, from the LED at the top, you trying to read that, Tim? Yeah, I'm reading it. And it looks like I might cut off a little bit of it. No, I, I get the gist of it. Yeah. Is bleeding into the sensor and affecting some of the metering. So I, I imagine it'll come out with a fix pretty quick. Um, 
that's just something to pay attention to. And I guess. Well, how do you how do you actually fix that if the if the LCD is bright and it's causing a flat, I guess coming off your body into the uh, into the viewfinder, the only way would be to dim the uh, the LCD at night. Wow. This may sound uh, bad. This may sound bad, but as a Nikon shooter, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, seriously, I don't, I don't know how, how they'll fix that. I'm sure they'll come up with some kind of fix, but you hope it's not one of those fixes where you got to ship it in and have it worked on. I mean, that would be for the, you know, they'd pay for it, I'm sure, but that'd be. Very yeah, you probably costly. have to get one of those Hoodman covers that, that blocks the LCD off. I'd also imagine if it's the the LCD. I know on on our Nikon that that LCD does not light up unless you tell it to light up, right? The top of the the top of the camera. I think as long as the shutter's open on our Nikon's, it's it's off, correct? Yeah, and let me go. Let me pull those back into the stream. You know that that top thing is not going to come on unless. Yeah, but I don't I'm, think they're talking about that. T- I think they're talking about now, the back. You probably, LCD. you probably can't tell. It's on now. Okay. What what are you ta- What are you saying, Tim? I think it's the back LCD. That's bright which is causing a, a bounce back of light back into the viewfinder, which is then coming down to the sensor. Yeah, that's what I... Oh, you think it's... The... I think it's the back LCD, not the uh, not the top one. Right. Somewhere I thought I read I it. I mean, the, my top, top that L- makes... LCD is dark. I mean, that's rarely, that could not produce enough light to do anything. Sometimes I thought... Somewhere I thought I read it was the top one, but that makes a whole lot more sense. Yes, the back one, that would be an issue. Right. Now, I think if you're wearing, let's say, a white shirt, and it would bounce off your, your shirt into the viewfinder, which goes down to the sensor then. Well, you know, I wish we had a Canon shooter here. I know on my Nikon, I have a little thing I can flip and close the eyelid. So if I'm taking HDR late at night and I don't want any light bleeding through the viewfinder, I have a little uh, lever that I can flip and close down that, that viewfinder. So after I frame it, focus it, and do everything else, I would close that down and then take my, my series of shots. Does that right, make sense? And on the Sony, uh, my uh, flash cap would go, can slide over the uh, eye cup as well. So okay. it works the same way. I like yours better where it's a little... Yeah, ours is built, ours is built in. They still have that in the D3 and, uh, and 3S, right, Scott? Yeah, it's a uh, little switch here. Just almost looks like a shutter. It just closes. Just yeah, like... I, I like that. No, it, it's good if you're taking some really dark ones. So I guess that's... If the, I don't know if the Canon has that, but if it has that, you could do it. Um, so anyway, maybe Kathleen should wait a little bit before getting the 5D Mark III. And she might start them. thinking about the uh, Nikon again. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Her ears are going to be burning. <laughs> yeah, she's probably not listening. She's getting on a cruise ship. This is the last thing on her mind. Um, but, you know, sometimes you wait a little bit. Like Scott was talking in pre-chat, and I was talking, too, about, you know, he wants to, he's going to get the D4, I believe, and I want the D800, and just waiting a little bit to let some of the kinks work out. The other news is uh, there's a new Canon, uh, this, and this is going to be good. So this, you know, I got to finish it up with something good for Kath- Kathleen here. Uh, Canon 1DC, which is going to be, I think, the first SLR to shoot 4K video. Now, if you're, if you're just a still shooter, like what, 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 what I do, and I think what you do too, Scott, that's probably not that. You know, who cares? I don't need video like that on my camera. What, first of all, what is 4K? I'm, I'm not up to date on my video terminology. Well, I, you know, you hear of 1080p or, or HD, full HD, 1080p. Right. I think HD starts at 720 and then full HD is 1080. Um, well, 4K is what? Three times that? Is, or, is it three or four times? Because I, I, I remember times. listening to about it. And, I mean, I don't know how much more detail you're going to get. I mean... Well, you, you know, what I've been hearing is that, you know, the 3D thing is just not taken off that much because there's, so, there's, so there's so many issues with it because, you know, one, for most part, to see it, you've got to wear something. Well, okay. I always said, I mean, if you're going to have a Super Bowl party, you'd have to have 10 pairs of glasses at 150 a pop. 10 pair of glasses, and then the angle that you view it at is not always good. So right. some of the thought has been, nah, nah, you know, that's not going to – to make it. HD is only going to have so much of an appeal. What is going to catch on, what is going to be the next thing is super HD. You know, I don't know if that's an actual term for this, but But it's a good explanation of it. 1080p is HD. I think you go to like a 24K or something like that. 
a, a 2000K, and then you go up to the 4K. And I think that's what's going to catch on versus the... But uh, you know what? I, I wonder. I mean, I, I know when I look on my TV, I see a difference between a standard def picture versus a high def. But, you know, you put my wife there in front of the TV, and she records everything on the TiVo that she watches on the regular standard def versus me. And I'm like, can't you see the difference? She's like, no. So Scott, you think she's going to see that much of a difference beyond this? <laughs> Scott, I mean, to me, I can't, I can't even look at a regular standard death picture anymore. I know. Scott, do you have the same issue at your house? We, we're, we're still uh, – we have HD TVs, but we're still – we don't have the HD boxes. Okay. I was just doing a little unscientific poll because I have the same exact thing as Tim. Where I'll come down and my wife's watching – well, I didn't come down to watch the Super Bowl. I was already there. But let's say she's watching a, a football game, and I come in, and I go, Dear God, why are you watching this on the standard definition channel? She goes, oh, is it on that? <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's obvious. This is not HD. Switch to the HD channel. And she can't tell the difference. And I think at certain screen sizes. Yeah, well, they say under 32 inch, you don't need to go to a high def. But, I mean, this is on – I have a 55-inch TV, and she can't see the difference. Yeah. I mean, if you can't see the difference, then I mean, I... yeah, that that is that is true. But anyway, the Canon is going to be the first one with 1080, well, not 1080p, but 4K. 4K. Video. I think the, it's not cheap though. It's going to be expensive. I think I read somewhere it's over ten thousand. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess I won't get one of those. I'll, I'll get myself a couple of other cameras. Or <laughs> yeah. But that uh, that's it for my news. Now, Tim, since he is a Sony guy, I think you have a little bit of news. Yeah, I was reading also, and uh, it came up on a, on a Sony website that both the Canon had issues and, and Nike and D800 was having issues. And um, some of the issues, and I, I'm, I'm going to guess a lot of this is going to be correct with the firmware. The LCD monitor is giving off a green cast, which they said could be corrected by changing the hue in it. The compact flash SD, to, SD cards are having compatibility issues. And apparently uh, it's cheaper in older cards. And when I look at that to myself, Somebody that's spending that much on a camera is probably not going to get a cheap compact flash card anyway. Uh, some of the other issues, tethered shooting when shooting in manual, if you stop down the lens or shoot at a high shutter speed, you can't see the live image. And then two other smaller uh, issues was a uh, fuzzy live view ma magnification and wireless flash trigger issues. Now, what I, what I see in my mind at least are manufacturers releasing these cameras really fast just to get them to market, knowing that this is firmware 1.0, and in another two months they can go through the firmware, get it updated, roll it out, and it'll correct these issues. Is that a good marketing decision? I, I don't know. I, I go back and forth, and I know uh, my camera, the Sony a77, had the same issue. And one of the comments that I had read on a forum was, it looks like the, the marketers want to get it out before the engineers get a chance to review the firmware. The firmware is out there. It's still being tested but they want to get the camera out to market. And is that the issue with both the, uh, the Canon and the, the Nikon? I, I don't know. But it seems like they're rushing to get these. And these are pro-level cameras. You wouldn't expect that, but apparently uh, that is what is happening. Yeah, I guess we're getting so much technology that there's, you know, there's issues that they got to work out. You wish they'd work more of these out. But as long as, as, long as they're firmware-related issues, that's all right if they're – more than that, where you'd have to ship it off, that'd be a problem. Well, I know. I just got a former update to my camera, and uh, it shuts off faster now. A couple, of, it, it corrected a couple of issues that people were complaining about. And will they correct other issues? Who knows? But uh, yeah, you know, another reason, at least for me, to wait a little bit for these things to shake out. You know, Scott, I had a guy. Um, I didn't know him. But he's on one of the forums I'm on. He. Got a, a D4 one, you know, early, early, like it's almost as soon as you can get it. And he, after taking it out and shooting with it and all, he noticed a speck in his, on his images. So he said, ah, you know, I've, for, I've forever done this with my D3, D3S, clean the sensors. I'll go and clean this sensor too. He scratched it. No. Scratched really... the D4 sensor. <laughs> what was he cleaning it with? A toothbrush? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, he, I think Cotton he was cleaning swab. it with, with, this, with the, um, I don't know, what those those little things that you can buy, the sensor cleaning kits, whatever he did, you know, he must have he had... He did wrong. He probably had something on the sensor cleaner brush, whatever that thing is, and accidentally scraped it across the sensor. Mm. Ah, that's got to be horrible because the D4 is not cheap, and now you've just messed up 
one of the priciest components in it. I mean, when you got a six thousand dollar camera, pay fifty bucks to get the sensor clean. Yeah, that's absolutely. the way I look at it. Have you have you ever had to have your sensors clean? I, I have. Um, whether they need them or not, usually I'll take them at the beginning of every wedding season and get both uh, sensors clean at a. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the place. I can find it on the internet here in a second, but I think it's, uh, I don't even think it's 50 bucks. I think it's like 30 bucks or $45 um, per sensor, and you sit there and wait while they do it. It takes like 20 minutes, and they get your cameras back to you. That's reasonable. <laughs> and yeah. so this is a lo obviously a local place that you go to. It's it's in Atlanta, on the outside of uh, right around the perimeter, but there's Maybe. two places. There's a... One place up in uh, Marietta, I believe, Peachtree uh, Camera Company. And then uh, I'll look them up here in a second and let you know. But I drive uh, through Atlanta to take to these guys. Like I said, it's a little hole in the wall build, and you would think it's a Nikon. And then plus, they're authorized Nikon uh, service center. Yeah, service center. So uh, they're uh, one of two in Georgia. So. I just let them clean my sensors usually once a, once a year. That's that's interesting. No, it's it's probably you know, obviously this show goes out across the whole U.S. and and even we're even hitting, I forget the last count of number of subscribers, um, but it's you know multiple countries around the world. But I happen to live in the same area that Scott lives in, so this is valuable information for me. You know, for you, you, you find your local Nikon dealer. Uh, and that would help out. Now, now, Scott, will they do what all kind of work will, will Nikon uh, authorized dealer do? Uh, they do pretty much, I think, everything. Including lenses, too? I, believe, I don't know if they're lens certified or not, but it's, yeah, the, the company that I go to, their website is cameraservicepro.com. Okay. And they're uh, listed. Let's see if they have an uh, address. You know, to in order to buy my D eight hundred, I want to sell one of my D two H's. I don't know why I want to keep one. I have two of them. They're only four megapixel cameras, but for some reason, I want to hold on to one of them. And my D two X, so I need to sell those. But I like to get them cleaned up before I give them to the next person. So or sell them, not give them, sell them. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, and get you know get that clean before I do that. Yeah, they're right off of uh, Cumberland Parkway. Uh, it looks like you take Atlanta Road and it's a little side street back in there. Okay. And, you know, it'd be interesting. I need to find out for – I don't have any Nikon lenses that need adjusting. My Nikon lenses are doing pretty good. But I do have a couple of Sigma lenses that I need to get um, adjusted because I want to sell them too. So I'm sure there's a Sigma dealer somewhere, hopefully here around here in Atlanta, I can take them to there too. Um yeah, that's good. I, and I, unless you feel really comfortable or it's an old camera, I'd be careful about cleaning your sensor. That's just not something I want to do. Yeah, no, I, it's not worth it. Well, you know, as long as we're on the topic like that, one of the topics I wanted to talk to Scott about, because he recently did, uh, well, I, don't, I actually don't know if it was recent, but you did an article on lens filters. Yes, uh, we had a big debate in our group about uh, if a UV filter, which is basically just clear glass, uh, affected the quality of the image or not. And some people were saying that, you know, they've heard not to use them because it affects the image. I'm one of those that, you know, I use them on all my lenses because I'd rather break it than the actual face of the lens. And so I kind of run a little... I guess a little makeshift test in my garage, and I mean there were slight differences between even within the filters themselves, but uh, wasn't enough to sway me not to take them off. I mean to you know to do, to do away with them because I would much rather like to replace a forty to sixty dollar filter than I would a a lens itself. Yeah, so um, let's let's have a little vote. So. Um... Scott uses filters. Tim, do you use filters on your lenses? I have mine right on it, right there. Okay. How about out in chat? How many people, use, with a yes and a, uh, use it, not use it? How many people out in chat use filters or don't use filters? Even uses them.
Not sure about that answer. Well, I think she was asking another question. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it, I guess if it worked out better if we had somebody who didn't use them. But I, I use them too. And I was just, I was about to say, there's some lenses I don't use it on, like my 50, because it's so deep inset in there, the lens. But actually, I have a filter on it. <laughs> so so that, that gets rid of that argument. But I agree with, uh, with, with you, Scott, that I, for a couple of reasons, I think it protects my lens. Um, I have cracked one of these before, and I thought, oh, God, I'm so glad I, w I had a filter on here because that would have, you know, could have hit my, my lens. I've also, the other thing, I, maybe I'm wrong here, but you guys can tell me what you think. I, sometimes you get some dirt or something on there, and while I do carry some cl lens cleaning stuff with me, I don't always have it convenient. So with a filter, I don't mind taking my shirt or something else and wiping it, wiping it down to clean that off. I would never do that with my real lens. I agree completely. So it, from that standpoint alone, to me, having that filter on there, you know, makes it worth it. And this is a, a 50, so it does, you know, the lens is really deep set inside of there. But even even on my, I have a, my biggest lens is a Sigma 120 to 300. So it's a, a good size lens. And I use a filter on that thing. Well, you really don't want to break that lens, is that what I mean? No. Well, I was amazed when I did my little makeshift test that even I even use different brand filters like UV filters and I think one was Hoya I actually had a Nikon branded UV filter and then a rocket fish the, the, I think it's Best Buy brand that's kind yeah. of a, an affordable uh, photography product but between those three there was even different color cast and hues between the three clear glass filter really which is pretty uh, unique I didn't know that so uh, the one thing I did learn from that test was you know if I can save up a little bit more money I think I might get all like filters yeah and then you can have a, a standard right. yeah I've always heard and I, w I wonder if you saw this in your test but I've always heard you want the good quality filters that there is a difference between getting one of the super multi-coated Hoyer, B and W. &W that's what I want to buy. B and W. &W or there's there's another one too. To, um, uh, Social T, I think. Tiffin. Tiffin, yeah. Um, that their super multi coated, good quality filters, have much much less of a distortion or, or image degradation than something like the Rocketfish. But with with the Rocketfish, how did what did you? And that had to be a fairly cheap filter. What was yeah, your... I think it was like it was the big seventy-seven millimeter filter, and I think it was only like thirty bucks. Yeah. Let me uh, let me pull up my blog real quick. But um, one of the filters was pretty close to uh, shooting without a filter at all. I think it might have been my Nikon. I can't remember. But uh, the the color cast was very slight between having a filter and not having a filter, and I forget which one it was. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I think there are a couple of things you got to watch out for when you have a filter, and that is, it can add some flare. If you're not, if you just that little demonstration I was just doing there with my 50, you know, and I had the 50 up, um, you know, you can get some lens flare there that you may not get, uh, you know, with without the filter. Well, you but might get some vision editing also. Also, some what? Uh, uh, vige <laughs> Vigenetting. Uh, Vignetting? Thank you. <laughs> and we all, we all make fun of how bad I am with words. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Not a problem. Vignetting. Uh, because uh, that's why they sell some slim ones also. Yeah, I have. Slim filters. I think the, the, the lens I have, and here's one I, I usually use the hood too. So do I. It's so extra protection for the front element. <laughs> Yeah, on this lens, I don't have a filter right now, so <laughs> that, was, that was, wasn't going to work. But especially on wide-angle lenses, you you want uh, one of the slim, the slim ones, so it doesn't have as big of a a ring. Because I have I have gotten where you can see the ring, and that does cre create that. Vin How do you pronounce it? Vignetting. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it does create that vignetting around the image that you don't necessarily want because it, it's picking up picking that up. 
And somebody said out in chat they dropped the lens. I I, I have a 70 to 200 to 2.8, Scott. Right. I was going to shoot a basketball game, and I had had it in my camera bag, which is a you know a nice you know camera bag. It's a the backpack one, and it was you know um, in there, cushioned and everything, really good. And I go and I uh, set the camera bag down, and I kind of I dropped it, but only like it was less than six inches. And when I did that, I heard something crack. <laughs> and your heart stopped. And and I had this is probably my first weekend out shooting with the seventy two hundred. And I thought, oh my god, I just cracked that lens and opened it up. And as I'm opening the bag up, I can hear a glass rattling around. It was the filter. The filter had cracked somehow. Um, and the lens itself, after I dust it off, you, you definitely don't want to take a rag and wipe it off then. No, no, then you'll scratch it, yes. Yeah, no, I, I blew it off, and I had one of those little brushes, and I brushed it off, and I got all, I got all the glass off. But um, I, I like having a filter for nothing else because I can take my shirt or a, a Kleenex or something like that and wipe, you know, blow on it to create that humidity on the lens and then wipe it off. With, with that, so I don't have. And to if you do it. scratch the filter, you can easily just unscrew it and put a new one on. Yeah, I'll tell anyway. you one big difference. And uh, Scott, I, I don't think you shot with film previously, right? You went straight straight to digital. I was film in college. I, I had, I probably still have, twenty twenty five filters that I had for my uh for my film collection. Whether it was fluorescent, eighty one A star filters, the only ones that I probably stuck with for uh. For our digital was the the UV filter, a polarizing filter, and uh, I do need to get a new, uh, neutral density. That's probably the one thing I would like to get. Right. Yeah, and I guess we've only talked about the UV because the UV is like the one. And some people use the what is it, sky, sky filter, skylight filter. Yeah, it's the same thing I think. A one A. Yeah, there's several different types of the same animal, I guess. I've always stuck with just the. I don't know if y'all can see that. Uh, that's not going to yeah, focus, but I've always I've always stuck with just the, you know the 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 UV for the general purpose always on a filter. Now the circular polarizer, you know I do have that. Right, and, you want to get the circular polarizer for digital, or for our autofocus, I should say, because there used to be a regular polarizing filter, and then the autofocus would not work with a a regular polarized filter, so it's got to be a circular polarizer. I did not I did not know that. Yes. I'm um, not sure if you can even buy a regular polarized filter anymore. But I generally only use those if I'm going out taking a landscape shot and I want uh, it will pull out some of the blues better in, in the skies and make the, the skies better blue. Or if it's going to be water in the image, it cuts on that reflection. Right. You had that one picture last year we talked about with uh, the river the river where you could see right through it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a case where I'm shooting the, the river. I'm shooting the Chattahoochee, um, Scott. And... You know, I, I could see the bottom okay with my own eyes, but that polarizer made it even better. I mean, all that glare that was on the water from the sun, it just cut right through that, and I was able to see the, the bottom of, of the water, and it made it much a much more interesting look, I thought. Uh, then the other thing that you mentioned is is ND filters, where you're actually cutting out the light that's coming in. You can get those in you know, one stop all the way up to probably 10 stop or more, or the, variable, which is what I would like to get, but they're like 400 bucks. Or variable. I would like. I have a four stop. I'd like to get one that's even more because I'd like. What I'd like to do is, you know, one of my favorite places to go shoot is Swanee Town Center, is go out there in the middle. <laughs> yes. Go out there in the middle of the day where it's packed, but in a lot of light would have a a, a, a ND filter on there to really cut out the light and get the motion blur of everybody moving out there, but have everything else, right. you know, be well lit. So that's what an ND filter would do for you. And then there's one more we didn't mention, and I had mentioned it in pre-show, is an uh, infrared filter. That's right. Have either one of you guys ever shot with infrared? No, I have not. No infrared here. In infrared is, is, you know, you always talk about landscape. The best time to shoot is morning or night, morning or afternoon. Golden hour, either in the, in the morning or in the afternoon. Uh, infrared allows you to shoot in the middle of the day. What, what you want is the brightest sun you can get. Um, and Tim, watch the type of Yep. The brightest sun you can get. So you go out in the middle of the day and you put on your infrared filter and then it'll, it'll the shutter speed, even the middle of the day at, let's say, F8 or F10 will still be about four to six seconds of shutter speed. 
Yes, because what it's doing is cutting out all the visible light and only letting infrared light through. And now all those trees that were green are white. They look like they're it's snow. Oh. And it has a really cool effect to it. it it's almost like Stephen's saying out there, like a negative. Uh, the, the problem is when you put the filter on, you can no longer focus or see through the, it's so dark you can't even see through the lens. So you got to pre-focus, pre-frame, then put the filter on, and then take your shots. And then the image comes back reddish. It looks, it looks just horrible. And in the post-processing is when you bring it all out. So it probably wouldn't be good for a wedding shooter, huh? No, no. <laughs> Although you can, uh, I had mentioned that Life Pixels, the ad I see everywhere when I go on websites now. I'm going to take my old Nikon D, D100, uh, ship it to Life Pixel, and have them remove that filter. There's a filter in there that, um, that blocks out infrared. I'm going to have them remove that. So then I can use that camera like a normal camera but get infrared from it. It'll have the autofocus. It'll be able to uh, have normal exposures, but I'll get the infrared from it. So what else am I going to do with a D D100? Fish tank. <laughs> or convert it to infrared. <laughs> because the, the, unfortunately, the infrared filters cost a lot of money. I mean, I think the one I have which is like a 72 millimeter, was almost $200. Wow. And then to, I really, it's not even on the lens I want it on. I want it on this lens, which is a 12 to 24. But that one is, this is, a, I think, a 70, 77 millimeter lens. And it would be, you know, much more, it would be like $400 or something crazy like that. So I can, I can get my camera converted for cheaper than I can buy the filter. But do you guys have any of those gimmick filters, kind of like a, what is it, the starburst or every little point of light? It does. I had that on my uh, film camera. I haven't, I haven't used that probably in six, seven, eight years now. Yeah, I, I don't, I have never gotten one of those. Yeah, I've always wondered what they really look like. But. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'd like to get. Makes a nice twink, nice twinkle on any of the, uh, the lights in the scene. But uh, you know, you can do that now post processing. I mean, a lot of the filters that I had, you can take care of with. Uh, post-processing in Photoshop. Yeah, and that's kind of the thing. I was thinking about getting some warming filters and doing that kind of stuff when I was, you know, from some of the landscape shots. But again, you can do all that in post, so why, right. why worry about that? Well, it, it, we didn't have much of a debate here because I think we all agree that we like having filters on there. I know that is a subject that, and that's the always-on filter, not the specialty filters like infrared or polarizer, but the always-on UV-type filter, uh, filter. Three of us all agree and it looks like most of the chat does too that that we use them uh, but it is uh one of those things that a lot of photographers debate i think scott you posted it in in your group on facebook yeah and not everybody agreed with using the filter right i mean yeah i guess it's just it, it depends on i guess almost how you were taught and what you read but you know one 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 girl's philosophy was you know she's paid all this money for good glass why want to put anything possibly to, it. to hinder it. Right. And my, my outlook is I paid all this money for good glass, want to take a chance on, you know, yeah. messing that's it one, up. That's one of those arguments that's hard to win either way because yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good argument either way. Um, it's surprising, though, what a little – as long as you're stopping down your lens, what, you know, you can shoot right through. I have shot, you know, soccer, not soccer, but uh, baseball, right through a fence. And because I was so stopped down, the fence just went away. Correct. Yeah. Yes. You, you can, you know, you can, uh, you can try this at home, is you can put like a, a pencil in, on, on your lens, take, you know, like take some rubber bands or something, put it on there, stop your lens all the way down. It needs to be something like a 2.8 or a 1.8 or something like that. You know, don't try this with an F6, F5.6 lens. Shoot it like that, and, and the pencil will just go away in the image. Have you ever tried that? It's crazy. So a little mark may not make much of a difference if you're stopped down all the time. But if, you are, if you're wide open, I should say, not stopped down, if you're, if you're wide open. If you stop down F8 or something like that, I don't know. It depends on what it is. At some point, it will make a difference. And if you scratch that glass, you're going to need to. I would think if you're taking somebody. landscape photography, yeah, you're, it's going to show. Yeah, see, uh, when I take sports, I'm almost always, uh, you know, a stop or so from being completely stopped down or, or wide open, I should say, or, or all the way wide open. But when I'm taking landscape, I am F8, F10, 
F-16, something like that. Correct, because you want to get as much in focus and, and, and anything on the lens will be in focus too. That's when I see all those dust uh, things on my sensor. <laughs> yeah, dust bunnies. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, we also want to go over another subject tonight with Scott, and I don't want to spend forever on the show tonight because uh, – I haven't mentioned this, but tonight is my 19th wedding anniversary. Oh, you figured out the date. <laughs> and two things, Tim. I not only figured out the date, but I figured out how many years. Because if, <laughs> yes. if this was number 20, I would not be here doing a show. I would hope not. <laughs> yeah, I would be. I would. We have. To, we have to do something special for number 20, which is next year. But tonight is 19. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. So, but we want to talk to Scott a little bit about self promotion because. On that same subject, Scott had done another post in his group about how many people call numbers on billboards. Uh, you know, you're driving down the road, you see whatever. It doesn't have to be a photography-related thing, but it, you know, I guess yours was centri was a question related to photography. You see somebody pay, takes out a billboard ad. How, how many times would you call that number that you see on that billboard? Or in the past, let's, let's do another poll. Tim, have you ever been driving to work or on vacation or just driving, see a billboard and say, I'm going to call that number? I might have said I would call the number, but then I sure as heck never did. Well, I guess that's the key. How many times have you actually called that number? Probably none. Come I can't Scott. think of once. Scott? I, I work for a billboard company, and I've never called a number off of a billboard. Oh, wait. Okay, maybe this isn't a good subject. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's... That's actually why, uh, I mean, that's, uh, I do a lot of self-promotion stuff, which we'll get to, but that was one, that was the reason why I actually asked that question in the group. I was kind of, I'm one of those that less is more type of people, and I think websites are easier to remember than a two-digit phone number, and I was just trying to prove a point to my sales guys. Well, it went well. <laughs> what? I don't know what that was. Go, go ahead, Scott. Sorry about that. I was trying to uh, prove a point to my sales guys that nobody called numbers, and that just kind of reinforced it a little. So, yeah, and, you know, I think uh, in this day and age, if I see a website, I'm more likely to, if it's something I'm interested in, to think, okay, I need to go to that website. Or I, I need to remember that website so I can go to it. Hopefully I remember it. Um, if, if I do, I might go check it out later. A phone number, yeah, I... I can't say I have anything against it. You know, there's nothing. You know, there's nothing bad. I don't care. I just have never called one. So that goes to for a photographer. How you know, and and you, you know, you um, have to do self promotion or do self promotion for your business, photography business, because you do weddings, seniors, what else? Uh, just regular portrait sessions. So what what have you found is your most um, effective marketing well for seniors obviously it's uh, social media um, seniors is such an easy market to uh, to hit and grow in because once you get that first senior session out of the way especially if you you know have like a senior representative or something you do something really creative then it, it kind of snowballs word of mouth and then I get a book a lot, if not, you know, most of my seniors from Facebook. I'll, you know, tag them in the in the pictures, and you know, they're friends to see them. And actually, I've got a whole album of nothing but self promotion, just little ads that I do in my boredom. Mm -hmm. And some are, you know, kind of edgy, some are funny, but a lot of times I'll use actual pictures that I've taken and, and come up with a clever ad, and then I'll tag the senior in that ad and a lot of times I'll try to do multiple pictures in one come up with like a big ad for like 2013 seniors and use all my 2012 one shot of all my 2012 seniors yeah tag every one of them that ad then goes to their page where all their friends see it so it's kind of like a little you know web effect no that's that's excellent because you're actually getting them to to help you with the advertising because right. I'd imagine, you know, boy, girl, whatever, if you have the good photos that, you know, Scott's going to take that you want to show them off on Facebook and, you know, then it just, it, you know, kind of, they, they're going to help you snowball that. And that gets more people coming back to your page and liking your page and continue it. And, 
and you know ultimately hopefully wanting to hire you and say hey you took the pictures of Susie yeah you know, I'd like you to take pictures of, of me too yeah and it's uh, it's really amazing to watch especially if I you know come out right after I get through doing a senior session uh, once I put the images up and tag the senior I mean I get like you know two or three friend requests within a few hours of, of doing that and it's you know her friends or his friends and you know, some of them may be juniors or sophomores, but end up, you know, booking them hopefully in the future. Yeah, you, you know, let me ask you this. So, it's always been seniors, and I guess, you know, the, is it close to graduation or is it the, all throughout the year? Or? I try what to target this? my seniors about, uh, well, this last one I shot about a month ago or three or four weeks ago. I tried to go about two to three months before graduation time, so that one representative that I'm going to use for the you know to kick off Scott Green photography senior sessions, I can usually start really promoting that look about two months, two and a half months out, and you know I can get ads in the yearbooks and you know go ahead and get it geared up, so when that graduation happens, I've now got those next year's juniors turning seniors that are looking for pictures most of the time that summer and I'm hoping I'm, you know, fresh on their mind and that's kind of the, my thinking doing that type of marketing. Yes, okay, so um, you put an ad in the in the yearbook, are they, is that open to just about anybody? You know, do most schools do that, do you think? I mean, you just have to contact them. I've contacted them one time, and ever since then, they'll usually remind me when it's due. Um, and I usually create an ad to go in there, the back of the yearbook. I use a half page, full color. Um, I create ads to go into the uh, local football, high school football programs, which covers, I think, football, softball. Um, I can't remember the other fall sports. And then also do a uh, kind of smaller ad in the spring spring program, which is not quite as big as the fall one. Yeah, I think I have your your ad up here now in chat. Is that is that one of you? That is actually from your website. I don't know if it's your ad, but it's from your website. Uh, let me pull it up and see. Yeah, that's when I was uh, you know call making a call for you know the seniors to. Reserve their slot. And those were all my, uh, you know, 2012 seniors. And when I put that ad up, I'd go through and I would tag each one of those, mm -hmm. which then, you know, goes to their pages. And then, in turn, right, and they may know a junior who's now a senior, and right. they're going to say, "Oh, that's exactly what I want to do." Right. Yeah, our little brother, big sister, little sister, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Coletta out there in chat. Uh -oh. um, so, so <laughs> do, do you you know you, so you shoot weddings and seniors the seniors that's you know this is again just me talking but you, you can correct me if I'm wrong seems like that would be a, a much less stressful maybe even more fun oh, so I love seniors I uh, they're so laid back they pretty much give me total creative freedom to do whatever I need to, what you know, they're up for about anything as long as it's going to be cool looking. And so, uh, and I do. I have a questionnaire that I send out that you know, kind of gives me an idea about their personality. Uh, you know, kind of quirky questions about you know, what's their favorite band, what's their favorite songs, you know, what what do they like to dress, you know, stuff that kind of gives me an idea and can help plan a shoot. So and we'll just yeah. kind of go from there. So, uh, how long have you been d doing this, Scott? Uh, since '04. Okay. Uh, just recently got into seniors. About the last, this will be my third year, I believe, shooting seniors. So, this is what I'm interested in. So, if I'm one of those people that you know, I would I would think everybody in this picture that you know I don't have the picture up anymore, but everybody in that ad that we saw a minute ago, probably love those photos. Right. Uh, I imagine they just. You know, they went home and they they have better photos than just about anybody else, other than their friends. At some point, some of those those young men, young young women are going to be getting out of college, getting married, 
and you're going to say, ah, that's Scott Green. He did an excellent you know, job with my senior photos. Let me, let me go. I remember he does weddings. Let me contact him and, and see if, about doing a wedding. Has, maybe you haven't been doing it long enough yet for the seniors, but do you see that as something that may pay off down the road? I've, I've probably got my first wave of those getting out of college, I think, this year. And I've already kind of, their moms are kind of local, so they've, you know, already said, you know, so-and-so may be getting close to getting engaged, so maybe get in touch with you. Or, so that's kind of my theory is, you know, if I can hit them, you know, real good in the senior year uh, photos and come up with something cool and creative and fairly easy to work with that hopefully, you know, four years, five years, six years later when they're getting married, I'm kind of at the top of the food chain when they're picking photographers, I hope. Yeah, no, that's just like a great strategy. I would think so. I mean, if they know your work already, why, why go look somewhere else? Right. Yeah, I mean, it may take a little bit to pay off, but in the meantime, you're getting all the senior work, and you get weddings other ways too. But it, it's a, you know, McDonald's kind of had that theory that you get you get the parents bringing their kids in, the kids get addicted to McDonald's, and then as they grow up, and then they get fat. Have, well, <laughs> you know, I didn't go to McDonald's to get this way. <laughs> um, but you you then get their you know the kids addicted to it the kids then grow up and they bring their parents or their kids to it and it creates a cycle and you know not that you're going through that whole life cycle but there is something to that you know if you are a happy person with the senior pictures then you know it, not everybody has this lo large pool of photographers to think of you're, you you know when you're the average person who's thinking about professional photographers like Scott they probably only know a few of them. And if you're already familiar with Scott, already know his work, already happy with his work, you go to get married, and especially if you're a female, the guy probably doesn't remember any of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're, if you're the female, you are, or, you know, maybe the guy too, you um, say, Scott did a great work for me, let me go get him. Now, the other side of that, and this is, definitely hasn't played out long enough, is then they start having kids. And I know you don't, you don't do infants yet, do you? I used to. I found out that's really not my uh, strong point. Uh, I try to take, if I do kids, and I still like doing kids, but I try to take them from year one after one year old to whenever. But usually the zero to 12 months, uh, I kind of like to leave to the, to the other photographers. Well, you know, that's where you can do some... Um referral you know for stuff refer them to another photographer right. but that sets up a good thing um so you find it easier to market yourself to seniors versus to you know finding wedding uh shoots or or what is your strategy for finding you know wedding wedding uh jobs um weddings i think most of those are probably word of mouth um but i do do a ton of self-promotion ads on facebook the same theory holds true with that I'll you know take a great picture from a wedding create an ad out of it tag the two cup you know the bride and groom uh, a lot of times I'll even you know find the venue and tag the venue and you know I've, I've got several bookings from the Carl house by doing that exact thing so um, and every once in a while I'll re-tag if I'll pull the tag down and then like re-tag pops up to the to the top of the uh, news feed so kind of dirty way to do it but hey it works yeah and I'm, I'm just as we talk I'm playing some of the senior shots um, all right so any other tips or anything for for people who are looking to advertise because that's I think that's one of the hardest things as you're starting off everybody wants to start off and just get clients right off the bat and just, well, I think the misconception is a lot of people think that they don't have to advertise. It's like, well, I'll stay busy enough or, you know, word of mouth is this, that. And I don't advertise so much to get the business right away. I advertise pretty much to brand myself. I just want to stay in the the now and the faces and, you know, whether – because I'm not my, – my, my style is not for everybody, but when somebody's thinking of a photographer, I want to say, hey, what about this guy with the green camera all over the place? Um, yeah, that, that may go back to the whole discussion about billboards. Right, and I've got a billboard up. Um, 
And uh, all I've got is my website and the image and logo on there. And, you know, have it, has it got me any, you know, actual, you know, hard bookings? I don't know because nobody's really said. But I do hear people commenting like, oh, you're out here, you're over here. And they think because you have a billboard you're uh, big time. But it's, it's just the whole branding aspect, I think, that, uh, that I like to do. At, you know, absolutely. All the you know the big companies, Coke, Pepsi, all that. You know, they don't expect to sell something from every ad they do, but the, the branding is huge, and it is something that um, you know every, if the big guys are doing it, there's a reason why they do it. Right. That that branding is is a huge thing, and you want it to be good branding. You know, I'm looking at the images here on your website. I don't think I've come across one yet that I wouldn't say, "Wow, that is an excellent photo." You know, you, you definitely want your work that you put up there to just be your top right. stuff. Because your your what wouldn't you say your what we haven't talked about that, but your website is is a key to your branding. I think it is. I think website is, and for me, um, I probably don't update my website as much as I should. Um, but now my blog, I try to mimic as close to the website style as I can. And like I says, my blog is updated pretty much. Uh, Every time I do a shoot or you know a post or anything like that, I'll uh, I'll update my blog just on a daily basis, and that's you know I'll send people to my website first because that's obviously the best of my best, but my blog is kind of the best of my best current work, so it's uh, it's a little bit more up to date, but you know they're both very strong in helping me uh, brand. And actually, on my blog. I've got at the top my actual three brands, you know, Scott Green Photography, Scott Green Wedding Photography, and Scott Green Seniors. And with that, Mike, let me go grab my power cord because I'm about to lose my laptop. You're about to lose power. Okay. We'll keep talking. So I'm looking at uh, – are you looking at these photos he has here? Yeah, I'm looking at – And I'm just, I'm just using the player in, the, in his website, so it is going by a little bit, a little bit fast. I can't, I can't make it stop. But, um, Can't talk about any specific image then. No, we weren't necessarily wanting to talk about specific images. You know, tonight Scott's been on before. We talked about some of his images. Right. So, you know, uh, if you want to know about that, you know, go back to one of those. Go back to that show. But I just wanted to play some of these images as we did it because he, he, um, he has such you know incredible images. And we're talking about marketing and his website. Your website is part of that marketing. Um, people are going to come to your website and check it out. You know, he, he mentioned he has a billboard. People may not use the phone number, but they're going to come to the website. Absolutely, and look at those photos. That's got to be professional. And that's that sells them. And that, you know, we've had Crystal on before, and I think we have somebody coming up who also have the the intro of their website is is video, uh, as a video of them shooting. So you, you want your website to be something that people are going to look at it and want to continue the relationship with you. Scott, I always wanted to tell you I love your logo. Thank you. Thank that you. is just great. I uh, try to use a. I used to do like every holiday. I would do the little, you know, Santa hat on top of it. You know, I've always just. I was like, well, that's kind of the center point. So I might as well just take it and run with it. So I've done some quirky things with it. Yeah. It says exactly what you are. <laughs> Well, we're we're actually at the hour already. It's already past an hour. So maybe maybe if there's anybody out in the chat who has any questions um, before we go, I didn't want to. You know, this is tax day. I think if you're in the United States, everywhere it's tax day, isn't it? I think anybody listening later on, it, you know, or if you're a foreign country, it's not not necessarily tax day for you. But here in Georgia, it is tax day. I've already filed my federal, but I owe in state, so I'll be doing that later tonight. Yeah, I owed in state this year too. I was like, "What the heck?" Um, so you know, you got to do that. And as I mentioned, it's my nineteenth wedding anniversary. So hopefully, I can catch my wife before she goes to, goes to sleep. But probably, probably not. She wakes up really early. Um, yeah. So I had put Scott's website address there, Isabella, earlier. I'll put it back up again. You know, you you want to go and see the images because even when I'm streaming here, although it looks really good. Still doesn't do it justice. How do you get people to look in love and not cheesy? Creative, creative guidance. <laughs> that's what is, I call it. Is that something that, you know, I guess that's, you know, you see when you watch a movie and you go, oh, that person's not a good actor. 
and that's because they're you know they're not. But I, you know when you're taking photos of two people who are in love, they're trying to pretend like they're in love a love shot for the camera. Wouldn't that be? They well, they'll look it. It'll look that way. Well, the good thing about weddings, obviously, hopefully, the day that you're shooting them, they are, you know, the most in love that they've been at that point in the relationship, and uh, you just kind of, I don't know, I always try to get the guy, because we're always the most awkward and, yeah, you know, pose or to, to do what, once you can get him kind of comfortable, you know, the, the chick, she's going to fall right into it, and then you just... I just kind of let them do a lot of times things on their own, and I just kind of shoot around different angles and this, that, and the other. Yeah. Okay. So Mike's next question is, uh, how do you get such good-looking people? And Mike's asking that question. I have seen some of Mike's photos, and he he has found some gorgeous people too. So it's not it's not you know, Mike is not short of his own gorgeous people. Uh, but you know. I'm looking in here, and, and you do have some excellent-looking models in your Pretty shots. People are fun to shoot, I'm not going to yes. lie. But, uh, you know, I guess that's the good challenge about wedding photography. And, you know, <clears throat> everybody needs to get married, whether they're pretty or, you know, not. It's your best thing is to give them the best pictures you can. And I, uh, I just look at it as a challenge. You know, either way, pretty or not, and it's uh, – just fun to do. And the next, uh, yeah. And, you know, you're only showing your good images here. It doesn't necessarily have to be a good-looking person. Right. But I'm sure that you have some images. You, yeah. You can only put so many up here, so you're only picking some of your best. Right. Um, the next question is, and this is something that is good for me, too. We gen we live in the same general area. You We live maybe an hour or so apart, maybe an hour and a half. Um, but, you know, finding locations. So I, I've... I want to take some pictures of my son just to, you know, not anything, just me wanting to shoot. And I drive around Swanee, drive around my area, and I cannot pick a spot that I, I like. I'm not nearly as creative as you, so I'm ha I have trouble visualizing some of that. So how, how do you pick your locations? Typically, especially like with seniors and even my engagement couples, um, I try to capture... I guess personality uh, within the location because location does help a shoot out a lot and um, you know like I've got an engagement coming up this coming up Sunday and it's with a girl that I sh have shot in the past a good bit and uh, we're planning the locations out now and you know I'll ask them if they're wanting something kind of you know country or some type of urban look or grunge or sometimes they want a little mix of all. And I've got a few spots that I'll hit on a regular basis, but I try to shoot them differently so they don't look the same in each each session. Um, but a lot of times the clients have their own, you know, spots already in mind and they'll, you know, just get us access to there. Okay, okay. So sometimes the clients are picking them out. But do you do you have any that you uh, are like your go-to spots? Maybe I like parking decks. Of uh, anything kind of, uh, I guess urban. Uh, being just you know 13 miles from downtown Athens, it's a. Uh, I mean, it is a just wonderland for places to shoot. Uh, you've got you know, like formal gardens to back alley, you know grind shoots it's there's so much in downtown athens which is one reason i like it so much yeah athens is a nice town i lived out that way for a while myself i uh, see some of these you know the images it looks like you're at an old abandoned barn or something like, maybe just an old barn um are these people you know or have you like gone and asked the the the, uh, the owner uh, if you can go there or is it just look like abandoned property and you just go there and shoot i have done the uh the, hey, this looks kind of cool. Let's jump out real quick and shoot. Um, but a lot of these, that you know, especially the barn with a couple, I've, uh, it's a friend of mine who has the property. There are several old barns on the property that, you know, he let me, he'll let me come over and shoot. I just give him a text beforehand, let him know I'm coming. Okay. Uh, but a lot of these places, you know, like the we shot at, you know, Foley Field at UGA, the, that couple, that's where they met. So somehow they got us permission to go there. Nice. 
Okay. Um, so uh, one more question. What kind of things do you discuss with your clients prior to the session? And um, I guess it may be different senior versus a wedding. It is. Let's, let's talk senior first. All right. With seniors, like I said, I have a questionnaire that I'll send out. And uh, used to last year, I've just started doing it middle ways through last year. Uh, I'd show up to a senior shoot, first time meeting the senior, the mom, just kind of blind to, you know, what really they just relied on me for everything. Well, halfway through the year, I was like, you know, I've heard of people doing questionnaires, so I would send it out. They'd send me it back, would help decide on a location, and we would go from there. Plus, I'd know a little bit about them, have some type of a conversation piece just when we started shooting. Because those first probably 15 to 20 minutes of shooting, or I call it the most, I guess, the awkward, just kind of breaking the ice, getting in the, you know, getting in the, the moment. But uh, that's what the questionnaire is good for. The engagement sessions or, you know, wedding couples, typically I always meet them in person before I even, you know, uh, book them. Usually I'll meet them in person to go over contracts and this, that, and the other. And I, I try to push them to do an engagement session because it's a good practice. I tell them for the big day of, you know, how we'll kind of work. We'll shoot the same way we're doing in the engagement, just you'll have on a wedding gown and he'll have on a tuxedo. That'd be the only difference. So. Okay. How long uh, would your average senior shoot last? I usually go about, probably on average, about an hour, 15, hour and a half. Okay. Uh, we can hit a few locations in that amount of time, too. So. Oh, wow. So an hour and hour and a half, you're hitting more than one location? And setting up speed lights and shooting. So that, take Mike Coletta. Yeah, Mike Coletta would just have his out of the back of the vehicle by that time. Exactly. And then he then he's scrambling for a power. Where am I going to get that thousand foot power cord? <laughs> It'll take him a second to hear that. Yeah, he's just kind of rip on me now about wardrobe and seniors. <laughs> yeah, so okay, so um, war, going with that question, wardrobe and seniors. So, um, do you discuss that beforehand, like what kind of wardrobe to wear? Like, if you didn't tell my son what to wear, there's no telling what he's going to. The only thing that I have a. Uh, when, I, when I'm shooting seniors and even engagement couples, the only, I guess it's a pet peeve to me, so I try to pass it along to them, is I don't want any, like, shirts, or I'd prefer no shirts with, like, like writing that you can read, like distractions. Okay. Uh, whether it be patterns or, you know, little logos, fine, but anything that says, you know, whatever, real big, to me it's just more of a, I guess, a distraction. It takes... The, the, the attention off the actual moment that's happening. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. okay. So other than that, you let them pretty much come as they yeah, want. Yeah, because I, I figure if they're comfortable in what they're wearing, they're going to be comfortable in front of the camera. And so. Now, most I've noticed most of them look like they, and it, hopefully this is just them realizing they need to do this on their own, but most of them look like they're, you know, their clothes is nice and neat and, 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 and ironed and their hair is nicely done. Are you having anybody assist them, or is that uh, maybe more of a parent or them themselves doing it? Uh, that's them themselves. They usually arrive ready to go. Uh, I've actually been, you know, in the group ch chit chat with Mike about, uh, you know, hairstylists and makeup artists. If that's something I really want to bring into my, you know, senior realm, yeah. um, I think it's a great idea. I just don't know. I don't want to mark the pricing up so much to accommodate that that right. it then becomes no longer attractive to the senior. Well, yeah, and looking at your senior picture, pictures, it looks like, at least the ones I'm seeing, that that's not necessarily needed at this point. Right. I mean, Although, it, you know, Mike has a re some really good shots. It look like they've done a lot of work in the, you know, hair and makeup category there. Yeah. But it's not necessarily the same thing that you're, you're trying to get there. Um, do you have uh, a go-to lens for your senior or wedding, or is it the same one? I'm kind of a creature of habit, and I'm trying to break that a good bit. Uh, my 70 to 200 stays on my D3S; it does not come off. So this is my probably my 80% lens, primary, I guess you would say. And then I've started using to get that cool wide-angle look. The uh, this is the 14 to 24. Okay. And uh, then I'll use my 24, 70, and 50, and 85. I use those all about the same, but 
My 7200 is probably my go-to all the time. Yeah, both on the Canon and the Nikon, the 7200 is a uh, 70 to 200 2.8 lens is uh, a real workhorse. It's a real good lens. I have the, I don't have the, the second generation. I have the first generation. I think that now they have the VR2 or something like that. Right. Vibration reduction 2. Mine's the VR1, I guess. And it is just an excellent lens. I tried to convince my, my wife that I need the 70 to 200, but $2,000 is kind of hard to fly under the radar. Well, one of the, I don't have mine on my camera right now. One of the lenses I'm going to sell is I had bought a Sigma. When I first got into this, I bought a Sigma 70 to 200 2.8 lens. And I, yeah, I thought it was excellent. It was a good lens. It was $700, $800, whatever it was. It's not super cheap, but it was a good lens. And I had a friend who was switching from Nikon to Canon. Yeah, from Nikon to Canon. And he said, hey, I got some Canon, some Nikon gear. You want to buy it? And he kept great care of it. And he sold me this at probably you know, 60% of its original value. And I said, yeah, I'll buy it. And then I did some testing. There was a significant difference in the sharpness and in the contrast and the color of this Nikon 7200 versus that Sigma 7200. You have to decide for yourself whether it's worth twice the price. But, hey, in my case, it's it's... And if you're going to be doing this professionally, it, it probably is. Well, Mike, I've got uh, that VR1 that you have there. Yeah. I just recently sold mine and got the VR2. Not going to lie, I wish I had my VR1 back. I don't know. what I'm just, I think I was happier with the VR1 than with the VR2. I don't know if it's just yeah. a mindset, but it's, I don't know. I love I love this lens. This is one of my yeah. favorite lenses, too. Fast focusing, good color, good good contrast. Yeah. It's just a great lens. All right. Uh, so, wow, we're at a, an hour and 15. Any, don't know what happened, but I have to get some lady time in. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, and Mike Coletta, this is my 19th wedding anniversary, so I probably should get some lady time in at some point, too. Uh, thanks for coming out, Mike. <laughs> the chat. And, Scott, thanks for coming out. You know, everybody out there in, in chat, thank you for coming tonight. Um, we will not have a show next week. I am traveling for on work next week. We will be back whatever the first week in May is. Uh, what was that? May 1st. First Tuesday of May is May 1st. We'll be back then. Uh, Kathleen should be back with us by then. Hopefully she's in her house, although she'll probably have some reason to not show up. <laughs> Um, so we'll, we'll be back then and this show you know I'll have it out soon if you are a subscriber to the audio podcast and we do now have this on Stitcher Radio which is audio only so if you're listening to this on Stitcher Radio and found us that way and, and wishing that there was a video portion of this where so you can see Scott's incredible images that we're all watching right now um, you know there is there's a video large and a video small and you can come to our website or go to iTunes and search for us and pick it up there um, and and we'll have Scott's email not, not email but your website address and all that in the in the show notes and be looking for that soon as you leave tonight don't forget to click on that little ad below there that I have showing up now and also we're doing another giveaway have you seen that Tim no I did not I don't know if I can keep these up every month, but so far I've been able to keep them up every month. And we have another giveaway. The ladies from Pure Photoshop Actions are giving away the, your, the action of your choice, other than their bundle package, which would be everything. That, that <laughs> That's would, the choice. <laughs> yeah, I know. That wouldn't be fair. I had to ask that question. But um, they are giving away that, and you just go to our website and find out more about how to, how to sign up for that. There it is, JPEG to Roar Giveaway. You paid the wrong giveaway, yep. I guess if you're watching us live, you're already at our site. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to – that's it for tonight. We'll see you in two weeks. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Yeah.